Yugoslavia was in the Axis for a whole 12 days and in exactly 12 days the country was invaded by Germany, Italy and Hungary, dooming the nation. Germany even promised Yugoslavia to keep their territorial integrity intact only if they joined the alliance. So what if Yugoslavia did? How could this change the Second World War? If you're going to dismiss it as nothing would change, I would argue against that. This is because Germany was thrown down in Greece, so they were busy before attacking the Soviet Union. Had Yugoslavia joined the Axis, Germany could start Operation Barbarossa a couple of months earlier, which would only benefit the Axis. This can snowball and result in Stalingrad to fall, which in turn means that Germany would get all the Caucasus oil. Or does nothing I just mentioned happen, and Yugoslavia does something that you wouldn't expect? I bet that you would be surprised by the end of the video, so stay tuned and see what I came up with. The Kingdom of Yugoslavia was a state that after the assassination of King Alexander I Karadjordjevic in 1934 Marseille became very unstable monarchy, distancing itself from the commitment of the Little Entente and striving for a peaceful coexistence with the neighboring Kingdom of Italy and after the Anschluss of Austria even with the German Reich. The country was not only linguistically and religiously diverse but also politically and ideologically. Out of all the South Slavs, the Slovenes were quite comfortable living under the hegemony of the Serbs, although they clearly sought a certain level of autonomy. At the same time, thanks to the Austrian past, it was the most developed region of Yugoslavia. On the territory of Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, the situation was much more complicated. Not only did Croats, Bosnians and Serbs live side by side in the region, who were already starting to hate each other despite the linguistic similarity, there was also a very strong ultra-nationalist Ustasi opposition, led by Ante Pavelic, who was the leader of the independent state of Croatia during the occupation of the Western Balkans. At the same time, this radical movement was heavily cooperated with a pro-Bulgarian Macedonian organization called IMRO, whose members managed to assassinate the aftermentioned King Alexander Karadjordjevic in 1934. You can see how Yugoslavia was not at all stable, and how not only they had internal problems, but also Bulgaria, Italy and Hungary claimed their territory. Anyways, the important fact is that while the Serbs and the Slovenes were anti-Italian and mainly anti-German oriented, the Croatian Ustasi were trying to break away from the monarchy and join the Axis. The Yugoslav regent, Prince Paul, has tried to keep these disunited nations together through the neutral foreign policy. But the following events in the form of the Anschluss of Austria and the end of Czechoslovakia and the subsequent invasion of Poland slowly but surely began to force him to decide whose side to join. Especially after the fall of France and the subsequent entry of the Hungarians, Romanians and Bulgarians into the Axis meant almost complete isolation for the unstable country. As the only pro-allied state was Greece, which was able to defend itself against the Italian aggression from Albania. However, the Austrian painter really wanted to get Yugoslavia on his side since it was a country twice the size of Czechoslovakia and at the same time there was a near infinite amount of chromium and small amount of oil that could serve the German Wehrmacht and the German Luftwaffe very well. Plus it was necessary to defeat the Greeks so the Axis could control most of the Mediterranean Sea. Bulgaria was initially hesitant to let German troops enter and fight in Greece and the Bulgarians resisted this decision for months. This and the many reasons I just mentioned is why Yugoslavia was pressured to join the Axis, but due to the internal pressure they left the faction and later were invaded. One of the factors that helped the Greeks defend themselves and even get part of the Italian controlled Albania was that Mussolini could not supply his divisions, as he could not send military material and new men to Yugoslav territories. Historically, following Bulgaria's entry into the Axis, Prince Paul meets the German Chancellor for the first time on the 4th of March in Berchtesgaden. The Austrian painter is willing to guarantee the integrity of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia on the condition that Prince Paul allows the Axis divisions to move new men and military material through Yugoslav territory. Historically, Prince Paul rejected this compromise but was willing to enter into a non-aggression pact. The German Chancellor disagreed and planned another meeting on the 17th of March at the same occasion. The deal of Germany guaranteeing the territorial integrity of Yugoslavia is a sweet one, but let's not forget that the Austrian painter also promised the same to Austria a month before he annexed it. This is why Yugoslavia was wary that the same could happen to them. Anyways, the pressure on the hesitant regent grows and a week later on the 25th of March he signs the Tripart Pact. Two days later he is overthrown and the still underage king Peter II is installed in his place. The German Chancellor, enraged that the efforts to befriend the state of the South Slavs ultimately came to a note, decided to plan an offensive on the Western Balkans. But what would it look like if the coup d'etat did not take place, or if it was suppressed in time? 
The then Yugoslav army was divided into two large wings, the loyal anti-German oriented Serbian part and the pro-German Croatian part. On the 27th of March, when the commander-in-chief of the Yugoslav Air Force, Dusan Simović, and his subordinate brigadier, General Burivoje Mirković, together with the Royal Air Force and the Royal Guard, staged the coup d'etat I just mentioned before. Then the Croatian part of the army offered a surprised regent to eliminate the insurgents. However, in our history, Prince Paul decided to refuse this, as he did not want to allow unnecessary bloodshed. Plus, his wife was in Belgrade at the time, whom he did not want to endanger with artillery fire. In this alternate history, however, the Yugoslav region decides to accept the Croatian offer, and by the end of March, the uprising is bloodily put down. The shaken monarchy remains in the Axis, and German and Italian troops are allowed to cross Yugoslav territory into neighboring Albania, from where the Axis will launch a new attack on the Kingdom of Greece on the 6th of April. As the German Luftwaffe is allowed to use Serbian airfields, it's possible for them to start bombing Greek Athens. The Bulgarian Tsar Boris III is subsequently forced with the support of the Wehrmacht to launch an attack on the Metaxis 9 in Western Thrace. In order to avoid another revolution, the representatives of Yugoslavia decide to remain neutral during this conflict. They only allow the Axis divisions to pass through their territory and choose those already mentioned airfields. Even though the Germans, Hungarians, Bulgarians and Italians now do not have to fight the anti-Axis oriented Serbs, since the German and Italian ground troops cannot attack Greece from Yugoslav Macedonia, they are dependent on conquering the Hellenic Kingdom from the Italian controlled Albania and the neighboring Bulgarian Tsardom. I want to remind you that historically the Axis had to invade Yugoslavia before they went on to capitulate Greece. When Yugoslavia was invaded, their territory was given to their neighboring countries, and the Croatian state led by the Ostashi was established. The remainder of Serbia was under direct German occupation, which resulted in this coin. This is one dinar from 1942, and funnily enough, it was created in Budapest, Hungary. This coin was used in Serbia during the occupation, which is a really cool piece of history. I have 100 kuna from the independent state of Croatia. This banknote was produced in 1941. It is very weird to see, feel and touch something that was made by such a regime like the Ostashi. I also have this 2 dinar coin from 1938, but this time it's from Yugoslavia. When Germany occupied Serbia, they forced them to change their currency and abandon the Yugoslav dinar, which promoted Yugoslav unity. Hope you learned something interesting. And now, back to the video. As Yugoslavia would help the Axis, the Greeks would thus capitulate only on the 21st of April, just like in our history, and Crete finds itself in the hands of the Axis in May. After the fall of Greece, the German Chancellor decides to give Yugoslavia Greek Thessaloniki as a symbolic reward to make sure that the Yugoslav representatives will not stab him in the back in the near future. However, I can imagine that it would be through Thessaloniki that Yugoslavia would allow Greek Jews to cross into Turkey, which at the time provided asylum to the Jewish community fleeing Europe. Of course, this would be done without the knowledge of the Axis. As for Yugoslavia, it would begin to find itself in an almost ideal position. Even though it's a member of the Axis, it's not at war with the Allies, and only cooperates economically with the Germans and the Italians. While chromium is exported from Montenegro and Macedonia to the Kingdom of Italy and oil from Vojvodina to the German Reich, the Axis in return invests into the construction of railways, factories and power plants, thanks to which the living standards of the people of the monarchy finally begin to rise. At the same time, the Yugoslav army begins a large-scale purchase of obsolete German and Italian tanks, fighters and bombers that could use against them in the future. Anyway, I don't think that mere economic cooperation would be enough for the German Chancellor. Just as the Spanish dictator Francisco Franco sent one of his divisions to the Soviet Union to fight against the Bolsheviks, Prince Paul would do the same, he would create an army of the Croatian Ostashis, which he would send to the Eastern Front. Yugoslavia could thus get rid of another dangerous fifth column, and at the same time, this is a gesture. The Austrian painter could be assured that this is an ally worth having. Bulgaria historically didn't send anything notable to the east, they just occupied territories in the Balkans. This means that Yugoslavia would be more useful to the Axis than Bulgaria was historically. This is the reason I assume that Yugoslavia's territory won't be partitioned, at least not for now. But let's not forget that the Bulgarian Tsar Boris III died mysteriously in 1943, and many today claim that the Germans got rid of him, as he didn't eliminate the Bulgarian Jews and didn't send forces to the Soviet Union. At the same time, with this step the Serbian part of the army could be reconciled, which could begin to secretly hope that the arrival of the British and perhaps the Americans on the Balkan Peninsula, they could use this opportunity to declare war on the Germans. 
In 1942, however, the new ruler is Peter II, who strives for secret cooperation with the Allies and to a certain extent with the Soviet Union. Thanks to the newly built factories, the Yugoslav army begins to quickly arm and recruit new soldiers. All over the world, meanwhile, everything is going on as in our history. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States also enters the war. On the 10th of July 1943, Operation Husky begins with the aim of occupying Sicily, and on August the 17th, the island is in the hands of the Axis. At that time, Benito Mussolini had already been arrested, and King Victor Emmanuel III appointed Marshal Pietro Badoglio to the head of the government, who tried to conclude a peace with the Allies. However, the Germans expected Italian betrayal and sent reinforcements to the Apennine Peninsula. When Italy capitulated on the 8th of September, the Germans quickly occupied and disarmed it. After that, Mussolini was freed by the German commando on the 12th of September. I'm telling you all of this because soon the Kingdom of Yugoslavia would find itself in a similar position. Historically, the independent state of Croatia gained much of their Italian controlled Yugoslav territories. And in this alternate history, Peter II is given Western Slovenia, the Eastern Peninsula, Zara and all of Albania. In return, he would see Thessaloniki to neighboring Bulgaria, with the German divisions occupying the then Italian controlled Greece. Yugoslavia continues to remain a part of the Axis, although its representatives are beginning to realize that in the near future they will have to decide when to join the Allies. In 1943, this is still out of the question, as the Allies at the time only controlled southern Italy, and the Red Army had not yet managed to approach the Romanian border. However, the German Chancellor is already beginning to pressure King Peter II to declare war on the Allies, or at least the Soviet Union. He would refuse every time that the German Chancellor asks, saying that Yugoslav army is not ready for a war, and that it would need to get rearmed and well trained. It is clear that the young monarch cannot argue with this claim indefinitely, so he decides to proceed with a compromise in which the military of the neutral state of Yugoslavia will take control over Greece with the promise that the British and the Americans will never be allowed into the Balkan Peninsula. At the same time, the Austrian painter can move his divisions controlling Greece either to the Eastern Front or to the Apennine Peninsula. Most of Greece is thus handed over to King Peter II, who subsequently secretly grants freedom to both Greeks and Albanians, and at the same time begins secret and regular communication with the representatives of the United Kingdom and the United States. Thanks to the fact that the Yugoslav army officially controls all of Greece, it must be clear to the Führer that the busy Yugoslav army cannot send its divisions to help him. After the Allies begin landing in Normandy in June of the same year and subsequently in southern France, and after the subsequent coup d'etat in neighboring Romania and Bulgaria, the Yugoslav army begins to secretly gather along the Italian, German and Hungarian borders. Around the same time, Yugoslavia officially would leave the Axis. The following day, they would declare war on the German Reich. The act itself will have great influence in the subsequent Yalta Conference. Stalin would claim Bulgaria, Romania, Czechoslovakia, Poland and East Germany after the defeat of the German Reich while all Austria and Hungary would become part of the Western sphere of influence this time. Within three months, both Hungary and Austria would be liberated by the Allied and Yugoslav armies, with the exception of the mountainous Tyro. The Second World War subsequently ends in May, when Berlin is occupied. The Kingdom of Yugoslavia was among the winners at the last moment. Because it never declared war on the Allies and because it secretly cooperated with them, the Southern Slavs would not have to pay any war reparations to either the West or the East. After World War II, Yugoslavia becomes one of the founding members of the European Economic Community and NATO. Along with other Western European countries, it would accept the Marshall Plan, which makes it the most developed and wealthiest country in the Balkans. The country would become a constitutional and confederate monarchy, with a democratic government. I have no doubt that since Tito's communists do not have that much support in the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, Tito and his comrades will decide to flee to Greece, where they will try to help the revolutionaries take power there. Tito will play a large role in the following Greek civil war. I have not yet mentioned Albania, which thanks to the liberators of Yugoslavia does not fall to the eastern sphere of influence. In any case, there is also a civil war between the communists and the monarchists, the latter eventually win with the support of the Allies. It is likely that the entire state of South Slavs will transform into a Swiss-style confederation, in which everybody in Yugoslavia would have their own canton. Thanks to this, the ridiculous altar houses that occurred in the 90s can be prevented. As for neighboring Hungary, even though it was not occupied by the Red Army, the local representatives decide to invite Otto von Habsburg to the Hungarian throne. Hungary thus becomes a constitutional monarchy, in which the agrarian party led by Mikhail Karolai is elected to the parliament after the first post-war elections. 
1955, when Austria is restored from the American, French, British and Yugoslav occupation zones. The local residents vote on a referendum to join with Hungary, thanks to which the new Austria-Hungary is created, although this time Budapest would be its capital. After the Polish suppression of the Polish workers in 1956, Austria-Hungary would decide to join NATO a year later, and it would become one of the founding members of the European Economic Community. Due to the presence of the Habsburg monarchy and the Kingdom of Yugoslavia itself, after the hanging of its tyrant Nikolai Ceausescu in the 1990s, Romania will probably once again become a constitutional monarchy, headed by King Michael I. Under these circumstances, the monarchy could also theoretically be restored in neighboring Bulgaria as well, in which Simeon II could once again become the Bulgarian Tsar after winning the parliamentary elections, but these are just only assumptions. In any case, it is possible that the united and prosperous Yugoslavia will be happy to help its Slavic neighbor restart its economy. But this is not the best ending that Yugoslavia could have gotten. In this video I discuss the possibility of Greater Yugoslavia being formed before the Great War. So give it a watch and see if Greater Yugoslavia can change its outcome. Thank you for watching and I wish you the best day possible.